Good afternoon. My name is Nika, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Electronic Arts Q3 2022 Earnings Conference Call. Mr. Chris Evansen, VP of Investor Relations, you may begin your conference. Thank you, Nika. Welcome to EA's third quarter fiscal 2022 earnings call. With me on the call are Andrew Wilson, our CEO, and Blake Jorgensen, our CFO. Please note that our SEC filings and our earnings release are available at ir.ea.com. In addition, we have posted detailed, detailed earnings slides to accompany our prepared remarks. And lastly, after the call, we will post our prepared remarks, an audio replay of this call, our financial model, and a transcript. With regards to our calendar, our Q4 Fiscal 2022 earnings call is scheduled for Tuesday, May the 10th. And as a reminder, we post the schedule of our entire fiscal year of upcoming earnings calls on our IR website. This presentation and our comments include forward-looking statements regarding future events and the future financial performance of the company. Actual events and results may differ materially from our expectations. We refer you to our most recent Form 10-Q for a discussion of risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from those discussed today. Electronic Arts makes these statements as of today, February 1, 2022, and disclaims any duty to update. During this call, the financial metrics, with the exception of free cash flow, will be presented on a gap basis. All comparisons made in the course of this call are against the same period in the prior year and as otherwise stated. Now, I'll turn the call over to Andrew. Thanks, Chris. I hope all of you and your families and loved ones are staying healthy. Let me first say thank you to our talented teams at Electronic Arts. All 12,000 people putting so much energy every day into doing amazing things for our players. As we begin, I'd also like to say a few words about John Martin. John's passing was a tremendous loss to the American football community, for the sports world at large, and for all of us at Electronic Arts. Through his years as a winning coach, as a beloved broadcaster, and as the pioneering namesake of our game, Coach Madden was football for tens of millions of fans. He taught us many things over nearly 35 years of partnership. Some of his most important lessons, including authenticity, are things we've held close to EA Sports ever since. We feel incredibly fortunate to have been part of Coach's legacy and just as fortunate to be part of how it will live on through the future of our Madden NFL games. We'll have more to share about how we are honoring Coach Madden in the weeks ahead. And from all of us at Electronic Arts, our thoughts and sympathies continue to be with his family, friends, and many, many fans. <clears throat> it has been a year of outstanding growth so far in FY22. Q3 was a record quarter with our live services and mobile portfolio delivering strong reoccurring revenue and year-over-year -year growth. Our franchises like Apex Legends, our EA Sports titles, The Sims, and more have universal appeal. And as we expand to more ways to play across more platforms and business models, we are growing our total players, engagement, net bookings, and underlying profitability. We didn't have a charge in Q3 as the launch of Battlefield 2042 did not meet expectations. Battlefield 2042 was always an ambitious game, and our teams pushed to innovate across many dimensions, including massive scale and 128 player matches, new modes, new dynamic gameplay, and more. Developing this game with our teams working from home for nearly two years ultimately proved to be challenging. Through our process for testing and preparation, we believed the experience was ready to be put in our players' hands. We launched with strong stability. However, as more players experienced the full game, it became clear that were un unanticipated performance issues that we would need to address. Some of the design choices we made with the game also did not resonate with everyone in our community. We are fully committed to realizing the full potential of this game and fully committed to our Battlefield fans. We've already implemented a series of major updates to the game and there is more to be done. Players can expect meaningful updates to continue in the weeks ahead and we are shifting the first season of live service content to early summer as we work closely with our community to evolve and improve the core experience in Battlefield 2042. Despite Battlefield's myth against our expectations, with the strength of our business, we are continuing to deliver record growth and performance in FY22. With Battlefield's performance to date and our decision to move the first season of live service into Q1 FY23 so we can focus on the core experience, We've adjusted our full year net bookings guidance to $7.525 which remains 
225 million above our original net bookings guidance for FY22. On the strength of our live services, operational discipline, and continuing digital transformation, we're reaffirming our full year expectations for underlying profitability. We expect strong growth to continue in FY23. Looking across our portfolio, we saw continuing year-over-year -year growth in total players, engagement, net bookings, cash flow, and underlying profitability in Q3. I'll touch on each of those pieces here. Beginning with total players, our games and experiences connect a global network that continues to scale. Over the last year, our network has grown to more than 540 million unique active accounts across more than 18 games and 25 live services, spanning all major platforms from console to PC to mobile and cloud. From an engagement standpoint, more players are spending more time in our title. Looking across our portfolio on all platforms, we've had more than 180 million monthly active accounts on average in our games during FY22. Apex Legends monthly active players are up more than 30% year over year in Q3. And across our combined EA Sports portfolio, monthly active players are also growing year over year. Engagement is deepening as well with players spending nearly 20% more time in games across our portfolio in FY22 compared to the previous year. Growth in our network and engagement continues to drive growth in our business. With our top franchises delivering strong reoccurring revenue, our net bookings for Q3 grew 7.4% year over year for the quarter, and the full year we project 22% growth in net bookings over last year. Performance across the business and operational discipline also continue to deliver strong cash flow and underlying profitability growth in Q3. The continued growth is anchored by proven franchises where we have a strong track record for execution. Apex Legends is now one of the biggest and most successful ongoing live services in the industry and is built on our owned IP. With more than 28 million new players joining the last year and new seasons and in-game events that continue to deliver new experiences to a deeply engaged community, FY22 is the biggest year yet for Apex. Average player investment in the game has grown significantly year over year and we expect to ex and we continue to expect net bookings for Apex to approach 1 billion in FY22. We are expanding to reach more players and viewers with new original content on the way. Our growing Apex Legends eSports ecosystem and Apex Legends Mobile will soon be moving into soft launch as we continue our worldwide rollout. We've had strong engagement and community feedback during closed beta testing, and we're excited for more players to experience Apex Legends Mobile soon. Mobile is a core growth engine for us, and it is accelerating. With new launches and acquired expertise and technologies leveraged across our portfolio, we expect mobile to be a major catalyst in FY23 with growth well into the double digits. Led by Apex Mobile, a newly updated FIFA mobile game, Golf Clash, and more unannounced projects, we are expanding our portfolio of more than 15 top mobile live services to reach new audiences and grow our reoccurring revenue. EA Sports is a powerhouse in the sports and entertainment world. We've driven hundreds of millions of dollars in net bookings growth year to date, with our EA Sports business up nearly 10% year over year. We continue to see incredible growth for the future of global soccer, and our global soccer franchise was the number one title in the Western world in calendar 2021. Madden NFL 22 was the number one sports title in the U.S. during the holiday period, and it was the number three top-selling game in the U.S. for all of last year. Under our leadership, F1 2021 also continues to perform well above expectations, with unit sales nearly doubling year over year during the holiday period. In our mobile sports portfolio, we just launched the latest version of our EA Sports FIFA mobile game around the world. This was the biggest update to the game ever, and early performance has been exceptional. Engagement is up more than 50% over the previous season, and retention in the first week is nearly double. With the added expertise of Playdemic and Glue, and a deep pipeline of new sports experiences in development, EA Sports continues to be an exceptional growth business, built on predictable and recurring revenue with outstanding opportunities ahead. Our pipeline further amplifies our strength. In addition to our core franchises, we are building new experiences in some of the biggest enduring IP in entertainment. Last week, we announced a new agreement with Disney and Lucasfilm Games to develop new experiences in the Star Wars universe, continuing our collaboration of more than a decade. Respawn is leading development of the next game in our 
action-adventure Star Wars Jedi series, as well as two additional Star Wars titles. This adds to our deep pipeline of announced and unannounced projects with our wholly owned IP, including Need for Speed, our Bioware franchises, The Sims, Skate, Dead Space, and more. Looking ahead, we are continuing to build on the structural advantages of our portfolio and accelerating growth by executing against our core strategy. We are focused on creating amazing games and content, providing creation tools for the community to engage more deeply with our experiences, aggregating and distributing our content experiences to more players on more platforms in more geographies and more business models, and harnessing the power of the social ecosystems in and around our game. The demand for amazing games and new ways to play, watch, share, and create has never been stronger. And one of the industry's largest, most profitable businesses with strong recurring revenue, we are well positioned to take advantage of this continued secular growth. We look forward to delivering against these opportunities through FY23 and beyond. Now I'll hand the call over to Blake. Thanks, Andrew. Q3 was a quarter that demonstrated the strength of our live services portfolio. Despite a tough battlefield launch, we came within a couple of percent of our net booking guidance and beat our expectations for underlying profitability. The quarter was the largest in our company's history for net bookings, underlying profitability, and cash generation. Sales of Battlefield 2042 were disappointing, but they are offset by a strong showing from FIFA and continued strength from Apex and our other franchises. We delivered net revenue of $1.79 billion and net bookings of $2.58 billion. FIFA 22's strong start continued into this quarter, with unit sales now up double digits over last year, launched to date. And players continue to engage in FIFA Ultimate Team and invest in their teams. This ever measured from launch to the end of Q3. Next, excuse me, net bookings continues to grow at an extraordinary rate and will deliver close to a billion dollars for the year. Digital represents 64% of our full game units sold through on a trailing 12-month basis, up two percentage points from last year. The strong digital mix for full game sales, aided by growth in live service and Q3 gross margins, 2.3 percentage points above last year. Operating expenses, which include recent acquisition costs, came in below our expectations, driven by variable compensation and savings and phasing of marketing spend. It's worth noting that we were able to hire more people than in any other quarter in our history, and we're continuing to invest. We now expect fiscal revenue to be $6.925 billion, cost of revenue to be $1.844 billion, and earnings per share of $2.43, up from our original X34 cents. We are taking our net bookings guidance for the year to $7.52 billion, although a $100 million reduction on our position at the end of Q2, it is still $225 million above our original. It is driven by Battlefield 2042 in both Q3 and Q4, but offset by the strength in the rest of our business, particularly in FIFA and Apex Legends. We're committed to turning Battlefield around and building a sustainable live service, even if some of the actions we're taking, like moving the fee, impact next net bookings for the short term. Reflecting the strength of our portfolio, our operating cash flow guidance is now $1.9 billion. This would be close to the largest full year operating cash flow in the company's history, despite nearly $200 million of one time tax payments related to acquisitions this year. With capital expenditure still around $200 million, that would deliver free cash flow of $1.7 billion. Note that this is $200 million above our original expectations for FY22 free cash flow. See our earnings slide for information. For the fourth quarter, we expect gap net revenue of $1.759 billion, cost of revenue to be $404 million, and operating expenses of $1.086 billion. 
This results in an earnings per share of 46 cents for the fourth quarter. We expect Q4 fiscal 2022 net bookings to be 1.761 billion. This would be our largest Q4 ever, even if we only count organic growth. Formally guide FY23 in May when we report Q4. But we've heard that some of you are concerned that the battlefield performance. Let me emphasize here again that we are a portfolio company. As originally forecast, the Battlefield franchise would have accounted for significantly less than 10% of this year's net bookings, and well below 5% of next year's. We're revising those numbers, but you can see it has little impact on FY23 growth. The main drivers of growth next year remain FIFA on console, Apex Legends, Apex Mobile, and FIFA Mobile. Golf Clash will also contribute to year-on-year -year growth since we acquired Playdemic halfway through the year. With regard to new launches in FY23, we've disclosed that Need for Speed is on the slate and we'll announce more titles closer to the time. In total, we still expect mid to high single-digit growth next year. To summarize, we just delivered the largest quarter in the company's history. FIFA goes from strength to strength. Apex Legends to con continues to show extraordinary growth. Battlefield disappointed, but our broad portfolio of games and live services insulates us from the impact of any one title. Our portfolio approaches, uh, approach enables us to deliver double-digit organic growth this year and continue to deliver strong cash flow and provide a strong foundation for growth as we look to the future. Uh, before I hand the call to Andrew, uh, you may have noticed that yesterday we announced a new CFO for the company. And I think the new CFO, Chris, is going to be a fabulous addition and will do a much better job probably than I've ever done. Uh, I thank Andrew and the team of our executives as well as the entire company for the amazing partnership that I've had here for nine and a half years at EA. It has been the most enjoyable experience of my entire career. I also thank uh, the buy side and sell side analysts and partners for all of their support over the years and wonderful interaction. And last but not least, uh, I thank Chris Evidon, Aaron Ream, and Fabiola for our performance that interacts with all of you. So now I'll have to call back to Andrew. Thank you, Blake. These are exciting times in our industry. Interactive entertainment continues to grow by every measure, and our audiences are expanding and diversifying. Major franchises are at the center and top of colonizing how games have the power to connect global communities. Our focus continues to be on our people, our players, and our amazing portfolio of games, content, and services and extraordinary growth opportunities in the future. Thanks to our incredibly talented teams in Electronic Arts, we are delivering entertainment to hundreds of millions of people around the world and connecting them through some of the most powerful and enduring franchises. With the breadth and depth of our business that continues to expand our network, deepen engagement, and drive, drive growth in our recurring net bookings and ongoing profitability, we are well positioned and strategically well positioned strategically to continue building on our success and delivering for our players. As we look ahead, and as Blake just referenced, we were excited to announce yesterday that Chris uh, is joining Electronic Arts as our next CFO. Chris is coming to us after more than 25 years at Microsoft, where he served as Corporate Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Cloud and AI Group, which he led with incredible success during Microsoft's transformation to a cloud-first company. We have a big vision for the future, and in addition to Chris's financial leadership of our organization, I look forward to with extensive experience driving scale and growth to help us achieve our goals. And leading our team after nearly a decade of leadership and partnership at EA. Blake has been an incredible leader, partner, and advisor. But most importantly, he is a goal for our time working together. His expertise and the team he has built have been instruments 
and have positioned us well for continued success. Blake will remain with the transition and special projects. Thank you, Blake, for everything you've done and continue to do for our company. And again, thank you for your friendship. Now, we're here for your questions. As a remote to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, or if your question has been answered, press. Your first question comes from the line of Benjamin Soft from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Hey guys, just uh, you know, quick thank you to Blake for being. And looking forward to meeting Chris. Um, two questions. So, first, just around Battlefield how you think about the vision for the future, particular how the new leadership for the Battlefield team is thinking about expanding and, and adapting that franchise over time. And then I've got a second question. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, vision um, for where this franchise goes. This franchise has always led the category in creativity, innovation, scale, gameplay, community, um, and as we came in, we had a very bold vision for this game. Some challenges, um, you know, not least of all, trying to build this game and find this game from home, and so our focus now is really making sure that core experience lives up to our fans and the community. That will continue to invest and grow the and buyer and, and others. You know, with tremendous back uh, shooters in the industry kind of leading the future. Um, I believe that, you know, we're going over the course of time. I think we'll expand to mobile and we'll expand to other new and interesting ways to play. Um, take a pause and uh, do all that we can for the core game and the core community. Just in light of the announcement that you guys are working on those three new Star Wars games, can you talk a little bit more about your vision for that IP? And is it fair to say that going forward you're planning to your own IP? And if so, what are the, like, some of the potential pros and cons of that as a strategy? Thanks. Yeah, the, the most portfolio. We have both a deep and a broad portfolio. And what we've demonstrated over the course of our, you know, the best part of 40 years is to really develop both our own IP over time, the Need for Speed, The Sims, Battlefield, Apex Legends, our bio development now, Dead Space on the way. So an incredible portfolio of owned IP um, that has across the industry. Um, Long-term enduring IP, we have the power of our sports franchises. And, you know, they are not just about licensing content. This is about working with over 300 partners across the, you know, the various sports industries to the sports, the leagues, the teams, the players that our fans love. And we've been doing I think that we'll continue to do that for many Like the Star Wars franchise, again, a long-term relationship we've had with, and this is not simply about building um, you know, or, or revisiting things that already exist in the universe, but really adding to that Star Wars universe and really deliver Star Wars fans to experience great Star Wars content. And so as you think about our strategy going forward and the strength of our company, it really comes down to our ability to develop and build and publish IP, but also work with partners truly deliver fan favorites with long and enduring uh, fan bases like our sports franchises and like Disney. Your next question comes from the line of Andrew Urikitz from Jeffrey. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for taking the call. And yeah, just uh, reiterate the, the positive sentiment from Blake. Blake has been a, a, a great run. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, I guess I just had really one question, uh, no follow-up. Um, you're one of your bigger competitors was just taken out. Uh, you guys have quite and have taken a portfolio approach for years. How do you think the industry will look 
in three or four years? Do, do, do you guys see yourself as a consolidator, a potential seller? Um, how do you see this industry shaking out uh, over the next three to five years? Thanks. Yeah, great question. And, and you know, you should imagine we, we've been thinking about this for some time, as it turns out. Um, and part of the reason why we have built the strength in our broad and deep portfolio and why we have gone out in search of the best teams in the industry to bring them into our company and build a global player base of what is now well over you know, half a billion fans is because we do believe in the power of entertainment. We do believe in the power of interactive entertainment. I think what we're seeing now in the marketplace is demonstrative of the value of what we do in particular. And so as I think about the future of the industry, I do believe that um, we will start to see end companies talk about this. But when we think about our players and we think about the things that they engage in, other form of entertainment, but they also consume you know, linear media and scripted entertainment and sports broadcast and, and music and other things. And so you know, we are building strength in our core ability to deliver interactive entertainment to, to our fans, which we think will continue to grow well north of a billion fans over time. But we're also aware that our fans are expecting us to find entertainment. And so as, I, as we think about the future, you should think about it with IP at the center and engagement around play, watch, create, and experience, all built on a deep fans together around the content they love. And when you look at our strategy of what we're doing around great, creating great entertainment, around building tools so that our community can engage more deeply, around the aggregation and distribution of content across platforms, across business models, across geographies, and really leaning into the social ecosystems that are born out of engagement in our games, I think you should imagine that's what the world looks a lot more like four or five years from now. Got it. Thank you so much. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Hickey from Benchmark. Your line is now open. Hey, Andrew, Blake, uh, Chris. Thanks for taking my uh, questions, guys. And Blake, I'm going to miss you, bud. I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of skiing in, though, so I'm not feeling sorry for you. But uh, it's been great working with you. So, uh, question is, um, I guess on Battlefield, obviously, it's it disappointed. Can you give us, can you size the units you sold in the quarter? I think you guided for uh, 12 <clears throat> or so, but just sort of curious where you ended up versus expectations, and then thinking about how you sort of re-engage that audience. Um, there's been some ideas around free-to-play, curious about the possibility, and then I didn't hear mobile. Did you drop mobile for Battlefield, or, or is that just delayed? Thanks, Seth. So uh, let me, Mike, thanks for your nice comment to the other analysts as well. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm sure I won't get as much skiing as I would like, but, uh, um, you know, we're, we're going to refrain from trying to give updates on units because we know that they're, you know, remember Battlefield is less than 10% of our revenue, so I'm not sure what you would do with that. Clearly, we sold less units than we thought we would, but what I would say is that, remember, these games are long tails. And so our goal is to add new content, new ways to play, new excitement, to stretch this out. And in some ways, we hope it benefits FY23 since we've had a pretty strong FY22. And so it helps us in the future. I'll let Andrew address, you know, the second part of your question. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, you remember coming into uh, in, into the launch, the demand metrics were very high. Um, and so that, you know, reaffirms for us that the core underlying creative for the game um, still has really strong demand around it. I think, you know, we, as I mentioned, we had some challenges around stability, particularly on high-end PC machines um, and performance, and there were some design decisions that, you know, not all the community really agreed with. And so our focus right now is to really go back in and make sure we get that stuff right. And, and as much as I hate to admit it, you know, DICE is a studio that has been able to do this a number of times now and really go back in, um, rebuild at the core, and re-engage the community as long as we do that in conjunction with the community. And that's what that studio is so great at doing. And so I think the combination of DICE, 
with the new leadership and a strong vision for the future, we will build out the core, we will you know, re-engage the community, and we will manifest that demand that we saw coming in a launch over the course of time. Um, mobile is still developing. The metrics are, are showing up really strong. Uh, I think right now, they're at the end of this month, uh, and as, as is the case of mobile, is you know we'll continue to tune and test in the environment. And then as it relates to free-to-play and other modalities of play, again, we have a big, bold vision for this franchise. Um, this franchise, since its inception, has been a leader in creativity and innovation. Was of how that we will continue to work ways to engage with this game over the course of time. And while you know, I, I'm disappointed with how it um, how it launched, um, I'm still very excited for the future. Eric Handler from MKM. Good afternoon, and thanks for the question. Um, Andrew, I wonder if you could just talk a little about what's going on in the video games industry in the last year or so. I mean, we're seeing a lot of user-generated content and, uh, and, and platforms around that uh, start to proliferate. We've seen a lot funding into uh, blockchain NFT gaming about you know those channels uh, eventually and it's easier to build um, once there's some just want to get your mindset there yeah. yeah great question I would tell you I I started this industry over 20 years growing entertainment industry on the planet it's been the fastest growing entertainment industry on the planet every year since then, surprised uh, by this. So we're not surprised by it at all. And I think, you know, as as technology has continued, um, we have been able to deliver new and interesting and fun ways to engage with content. And what we've seen more recently is just how the social networks born out of engagement in our games truly are. And ingesting entertainment the same way do traditional scripted media or traditional broadcast or traditional music. This is about experiencing entertainment with your friends, and that's unbelievably powerful. I think that has been really the fuel that has driven the growth in, in recent time. As part of that, of course, the input into that ecosystem has become a really valuable part of, of what our industry offers to our players and our fans. The traditional media is just true. Again, it's been at the very center of the Sims for a long time. It's at the very center of modes like FIFA Ultimate Team and Madden Ultimate Team. It's at the very center of the design of Skate, which will be launching soon. Um, and so this concept of UGC, or user-generated content, is really just an extension powered by friends in and around experiencing what is the best entertainment on the planet. And, and, I, and so I believe that's gonna be a really important part of our future. Now, to the extent whether we wanna you know, build that out or buy that over time. Right now, we, we are building. Um, we're building technology. We're building creative. We're building assets, and we're we're offering that out to communities around the world. And we're seeing great uptake of that. Um, the opportunity in the future, um, we would openly look at that, but we don't. We're not looking at anything at this juncture. Um, around the NFT and and where VCs are investing, again, we see this also happen in our industry. We saw it with 3D, we saw it with AR, VR. There's always something in and around our industry that is driving a lot of external investment. Collectability is really built on four key metrics. It's around high density, it's around provable authenticity, and it's around a, a a group of people that find value in that content. And we've seen that happen in the virtual world. We've seen, certainly seen that happen in and around our games for some number of years. And I believe that collectability of you know, our industry, whether that's as part of the NFT and the blockchain, well, that remains to be seen. And I think you know, the way we think about it is we want to deliver the best possible player experience we can. And so we're going to we'll evaluate that over time, but right now it's not something that we're driving hard against. 
Your next question comes from the line of Matthew. Your line is now open. Hey, good afternoon, Andrew and uh, Blake. Uh, absolute best ever here. It's been a, been a pleasure. For, first, for me, you, you guys talked about um, in the back half of the fiscal year, obviously, Battlefield missed in, in FIFA, Apex, and others. With, with FIFA in particular, I guess, you, know, you talked a lot about kind of unit strength year on year. I'm just kind of curious how you felt about or are feeling about uh, you know, ultimate team and, and the, the live services component into the, into the back half of the year. Uh, I guess it's the first question. Second question, um, curious, coming back to, to, to mobile and, and maybe some of the recent acquisitions, kind of curious if you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about advertising. I know it's come up a bit. You know, other companies might get, you know, 10 to 20 percent of their, you know, mobile bookings from, from some new capabilities to you. So I'm curious how you're thinking about advertising. I'm curious how you're thinking about the glue pipeline deal. Um, and then also I, when we might start to hear a little more about kind of what your plans are with, with metal, metal, uh, Metalhead and, um, and Super Mega Baseball. Uh, thanks, guys. So let me, I'll start on the live service piece, and then I'll let Andrew hit the second question. Um, you know, when the quarter was 9% and trailing 12 months is 21%, and that's across all of our live services. And so... If you look at something like Apex or FIFA, they're clearly well north of that. Um, you'll continue to feel it is one of the cores of our business because it is reoccurring and highly dependent on the social networks that we've created in our games. And particularly on sports, those are evergreen networks that continue every year. And so the metrics we see are exceptional up well over last year. Um, you know, you look at the Apex numbers as we reported, a dramatic improvement year over year, and everything they do is continuing to try to drive um, engagement with people. They've brought in a large number of new players into the game, retained players, and unique ideas for ways to play. Um, so we're we're very excited about how that continues, and it continues across all of our sports, and we're looking as to how do we do that across more and more games. So uh, I'll let Andrew talk about glue a little bit. Yeah, um, again, we, we are working closely with glue. It's still, you know, it's still relatively early days, um, you know, with the acquisition for both them and Playdemic. Uh, and we're working both on bolstering our existing 15 live services and building out new ones. And as per my prepared remarks, you know, we're projecting well into double-digit growth next year. Um, and that includes Apex Mobile and a renewed FIFA Mobile uh, and a full year of uh, Golf Clash and, you know, ongoing growth across the portfolio. Um, and, and we're excited about that. With respect to advertising specifically, we are taking... Uh, the glue advertising stack and, uh, and uh, applying it across our games. And it's a little early to know just yet exactly how that will manifest, but based on what we're seeing across the industry, we expect that that represents um, some, some revenue growth. But mobile now really is a strength of ours. Um, it's a very uh, important part, both in our existing games, in our new launches, and with the potential of mobile advertising across the portfolio. Your next question comes from the line of Drew Cross from Ethel. Your line is now open. Okay, thanks. Hey, guys, good afternoon, and Blake, best of luck. Um, curious as to your thoughts on where the business is in terms of engagement normalizing. Uh, is the reopening headwind behind you, or is this something we should anticipate in calendar 22? Is it contemplated in your fiscal 23 net bookings forecast? And then separately, your OPEX growth year-to-date is approaching 30% year-on-year. Should we see that slow materially once you start the anniversary acquisitions, or how should we be thinking about OPEX going forward? Thanks. Yeah, I can take the OPEX question quickly, Drew. I mean, clearly most of that was driven by two things. One is our acquisitions, probably the biggest driver of it, but second is 
driven by the fact that we've used this opportunity of some, uh, you know, uh, questions in uh, the gamer community about which companies are going to be around and which aren't, and we've been able to hire some amazing talent during that because of our stability. And so that doesn't continue on forever. Obviously, the acquisition growth is a one-time component. <coughs> component, sorry. So I think we're remember our opex was really comes down to two things: headcount and marketing expense. So the marketing expense will swing by the titles that are in any one year, uh, but we're pretty good at managing that. And the headcount, we're also very good at managing. And so I don't think you're going to see a jump like we've seen this past year. But remember, even with the OPEX growth that you see, look at the Q3. I mean, clearly we've been able to manage that even with a down draft of, you know, $48 million in revenue that we didn't originally plan. And so we were a pretty flexible organization to be able to try to manage that to keep margins going. And so I think you'll see that going forward. On engagement, um, uh, you know, through or post-COVID, depending on how you think about it, you know, I think we've been on a rolling situation around the world um, of kind of coming back and, you know, shutting down a little and coming back. Um, broadly speaking, though, um, much of them, they're at sporting events, they're going to theme parks, they're watching movies, they're, you know, they're going to dinner. So, so much of the world has returned mostly to normal at this juncture by, by our calculation. Um, even as part of that, we've seen, you know, not only number of players grow again over over 540 million people now in our network. We've also seen time spent uh, in our games grow by over 20 percent. Um, and I, I I kind of looked at that as not just about creating amazing games and entertainment, but it is the social interaction. Um, I think what COVID has taught us is that games are a great way not just to get our entertainment fix, to remain deeply connected with our friends and fans and rivals. And what we're seeing now, I believe, is actually the long-term effect of the discovery of not just the value of, our, of what we do in terms of entertainment, but also the value in maintaining connections with those we care most about. And we would expect that to, to continue and actually create a flywheel for added growth. comes from the line of Jason Bazinet from City. Your line is now open. Uh, thanks. I think it's a little bit early to talk about this, but um, I would be very curious about how you're thinking about this to the metaverse as that becomes more real. Is that is that something that you view as just another opportunity for you to engage your fans? Is it a battle about time spent? Is it potentially sort of change industry sort of rev shares, or is it just sort of a non-event, and you guys think you can just sort of continue to focus on your IP and engagement, and it's really sort of not material. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, a great question, and certainly another one of these things that is kind of the topic du jour at the, the moment, uh, and and many and many people are talking about it um, in different contexts, quite frankly. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the metaverse is a three-dimensional social space where you come together to experience things with your friends. Uh, and for now, much of that happens in the two-dimensional internet um, around, you know, the social networks that we see. But I would tell you, a lot of that happens in the context of our games. And as I look at the nature of our games and I look at the engagement that we're seeing inside these 3D spaces that we create in and around sports and other uh, um, other worlds, what, what you see with our industry is the beginnings of what a metaverse might be. And over the course of time, you should expect us to continue to expand and extend the worlds that we have been creating for the last 30 years and deliver more experiences beyond the core conceit of the game. So what can you do in FIFA beyond playing football? What will you do in Need for Speed beyond driving the game? What will you do in The Sims as you come together um, with your friends beyond the creation of content. Um, and, and you'll see that continue to evolve for us over the course of time. And I don't know ultimately what the metaverse will become, um, but what I do know is that the games we create um, are becoming more important 
as social spaces than they are just as places to enjoy great entertainment. As we continue to build out those experiences, um, as, 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 as whatever the metaverse becomes, it's an almost certainty that we will play a very important role in it and that our players will be on the leading edge of the evolution of what these spaces might become. That's super helpful. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Dino from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for the question. Um, I just have two. First, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, EA Play. You know, where are we with EA Play subscribers today, and um, how do you see the outlook for video game subscription services changing, particularly with recent consolidation? And then second, uh, it was encouraging to hear the uh, reiteration of the mid to high single-digit top-line growth for next year. I was wondering if you could go a little bit more in detail around some of the drivers. Um, you know, what do you see driving some of the FIFA strength, and uh, are there new games or unannounced titles embedded in that outlook? Thank you very much. Yeah, let me quickly hit on the EA Play component, uh, and then I'll let Blake talk about um, the, the mid to high single-digit growth. Uh, EA Play continues to grow for us. It continues to be a really, really positive consumer experience of getting access to some of the greatest content in the industry. Um, what you know, what we see more broadly continues to be a core driver, um, and, and that what we're able to do is perhaps in a way even in, that's stronger than traditional linear or scripted entertainment. Um, I, I think that you'll, you know, we will continue to see consumers engage in our content through subscription, and we'll continue to provide our content that way across platform, and we. we continue to be you know, the leading provider of a gaming subscription across platforms in our industry. Um, and with the depth and breadth of our portfolio, we believe that um, we're going to continue the course of time, back to my earlier point around entertainment, you might expect that in just games in the context of that subscription around a broader service for our players. And we're pretty excited about what that might be. And, you know, on the 20 23 question, obviously, as we said, we're not yet ready to give guidance, which we normally don't do at this time. And, you know, the keys to driving growth are obviously our core portfolio, things like FIFA, for example, and live services, so hockey, other sports. Um, Apex Legends obviously has continued to evolve and shown amazing growth. Apex Legends mobile game in the market. We don't know exactly what time that will be in their game as well as the Chinese build for that game. And we're working with a partner there and things are going very well in test, but we're excited about that as a major growth driver. Um, we will have more growth, we think, out of the FIFA mobile game that we just put into the market. And remember that we are booked really a it's called Clash Game. Uh, we'll have a full year of that next year. And we're working with Playdemic on how they can take their uh, sports areas where we have licenses already. And game coming. And there are two that we haven't announced yet, but you can imagine we are always trying to find ways to grow the portfolio year over year through new titles, new IP, and expansion, and as well acquisitions, which right now we're in the digest mode, but doesn't mean that we won't keep looking at it. We're excited about next year. It looks uh, like a strong year to come, and as Andrew said, we know that this is one vehicles in the world right now, so we're really in the sweet spot, and that's what gets us excited about it. Great. Thank you both. That was incredibly helpful. And Blake, uh, best of luck in your next chapter. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Great. Thanks for taking the questions. And uh, Blake, it's been a pleasure interacting with you over the years. Yeah, I guess the first question is more you know, spending uh, playing time is uh, 
increased 20 percent um, you know, this quarter compared to the year prior. Uh, what was the largest driver of that? And I don't know if you have this data, but um, what's the typical lag historically between you know growth and time spent and uh, monetization? Um, and then secondly, you guys didn't really talk about Madden as much on this call, so just wondering what the delta is between its performance versus like a FIFA. Um, are, are things like preview packs and FIFA kind of driving the growth? I'd imagine that you can talk about things. Um, so let me let me start with Madden. Madden is also having a great year, and we're seeing tremendous growth. As you know, and for all of you who follow the season, this has been a an unbelievably exciting season of football. Um, and what we know is for 49ers. Unless, well, it was exciting for a, for a second, um, and and then it was. But it's been you know the playoff games and the season overall has been an unbelievably exciting game. The ratings for the NFL have been you know, extremely strong through the years, and that's driving really strong engagement in and around our Madden franchise, and um, it continues to go from strength to strength. Um, with respect to um, what drove engagement, you know, again, we have this great portfolio, and while we certainly saw extraordinary growth in Apex Legends, we saw great growth in FIFA, we also saw growth across, on, you know, Apex was 30%, you know, FIFA was, was our eSports portfolio was up 10% um, on, on what is a very big number. But, you know, we've seen growth across the portfolio, and that speaks to the value of the breadth and the depth of our portfolio. Um, in terms of lag between engagement and, and monetization growth, which I think was one part of your question there, um, I don't have exact numbers uh, for you on that. What I would tell you is our teams work very closely with the communities and ensure that they're always providing new and interesting content. And what we know about all of our communities they play is they make a choice of do they want to invest more time or do they want to invest more money in the experience. And it's really the ability to build that balanced ecosystem that speaks to the strength of our life our services over time. And so it's a very symbiotic relationship that happens between the investment of time and the investment of money over, over the course of the experience. And our teams have become very, very good at that and work very, very closely with their communities to try it. Yeah, and one thing I just remind everybody, and uh, we may have already said this, but I'll say it again. Um, you know, we shipped last year order due to the pandemic. We delayed it three weeks and moved it into the third quarter. Uh, we shipped it this year in the second quarter. So when you look at the growth of the third quarter, knowing that that didn't include the initial ship in of FIFA, it, it's almost hard to believe the strength of the business. And so I just want people not to forget that. And we're not going to provide numbers or details around that exactly, but just know that the CEO having moved it back to the second quarter, it's pretty impressive. Very helpful. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Marrock from Raymond James. Your line is now open. Thanks for taking my questions and wanted to pass my uh, best wishes on to Blake as well. Um, on Apex Legends, so season 12 seems like a more substantial content drop than the typical season. So content or, or type of content, is there anything that particularly stands out? out as a driver for new player acquisition and engagement, whether it's game modes, new maps, or things like that. And then second on FIFA, um, around the, the growth in unit sales year over year, I guess at this point, who was interested in FIFA 22 that maybe wasn't in FIFA 21? Were there any particular markets or customer segments that saw solid unit growth? Thank you. Wow, some detailed questions. A new, a new ways to connect. Um, remember, Apex is now well over 100 million. One size fits all components.
delivery of really interesting new content, new maps, and new modes of play on a season-by-season -season basis that has continued to grow. Football, or soccer as we call it in this country, continues to grow. Um, the leagues, the teams, the players are going from strength. build our fan base. Again, you know, if you think about the fan base we have uh, for our product or our service, it's the largest digital football of. And the reason we're able to continue to drive growth in and around that franchise is because we are delivering them, again, content, gameplay, modalities of play um, that is most interesting uh, and most exciting to them and connects them most deeply with the sport they love. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Doug Gritz from Calvin. Your line is still open. Hey, thank you. Um, Paramount Plus dropped a pretty expensive-looking Halo trailer over the weekend, and Netflix has had some success with The Witcher and League of Legends uh, on their streaming service. There's, there's absolutely ravenous demand for content right now from a half a dozen or so streaming services, and you guys have some IP, particularly within Bioware, that I, I think would be pretty, pretty, pretty good uh, as a basis for a, for a show. Are we are we finally at a point where video game IP has as some meaningful transmedia opportunities, uh, more a theory than a reality. No, I think I think what based on exactly what you just said and what we've experienced, you know, there's you know, it, video game IP or interactive entertainment IP is now some of the most culturally relevant IP in all of entertainment, um, and I think that's going to continue to grow when you think about you know around the IP we create. Like, like The Sims, like Need for Speed, like our Bioware franchises, like Dead Space, like Skate. Um, it's not unnatural for that to spawn kind of a scripted element. I think traditionally the scripted entertainment element in our industry in and of themselves, but where they have been of high quality, they've lifted the overall engagement of the franchise more deeply. So there's kind of a one-two punch that drives growth in the business. I think as we think about our future, um, we do believe that th this time is becoming more and more important on a daily basis to all fans, and that our fans are going to want to experience that in many different modalities, and some of that might be scripted entertainment in, in nature. Um, and you should expect that, that we're, we're looking at any and all aspects that allow us to extend and expand our brands um, for our fan base, but that we're doing it very thoughtfully um, and, again, as part of our strategy, doing it profitably. Great. Thanks, Andrew, and best wishes, Blake. Thanks, Doug. Uh, look, everyone's very kind of words, um, and I'll be around for a while and make sure that uh, we get our new CFO fully on board, and as I said, he'll do much better than me. So uh, everyone stay healthy, and we look forward to talking to you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.